Uh, today we are wrapping up the series, this three-part series uh, on baptism that we've done over the last couple of weeks. Um, if you missed either of the last two messages, I would encourage you uh, to go online. You can watch those messages on our uh, YouTube or Vimeo pages. Uh, you can find them within the app. Um, if you need help finding it, let me know. Uh, but if you missed any of those... <clears throat> please go back and review those things because all of these three go together and each of them are important for understanding what is happening in the water of baptism. Uh, Next week, we are moving on to uh, our our new thing, moving on to the next thing in our schedule. Uh, Next week begins the season of Advent that leads us up to uh, Christmas. And so we will be starting next week uh, with a series called The Promise uh, that will lead us up to Christmas. But today we are finishing up our uh, look at baptism. It's a common experience for parents, um, and I know I've had it uh, all the time, a common experience to try to uh, convince your kids uh, to take a bath. Uh, I don't understand why there is some sort of resistance to bathing uh, for kids. I try, to, I try to explain sometimes, I try to get the, inside their head that actually taking a bath, taking a shower um, is a good thing. Like it is actually a luxury that we enjoy. It can be a refreshing, enjoyable experience. It is not punishment. Right, um, and, and in fact, you can probably think of times in your life where a a shower uh, was just a really highlight a highlight of that particular day. Like it was it was something that you were looking forward to as you were doing things that day. Maybe you were out uh, doing yard work or out playing some uh, sport that you're involved in, or just had a, a hard day at, at work or doing something, uh, and you just were looking forward to the refreshment that comes from the shower. I can remember years ago, um, one that was notable to me uh, was uh, back when I was in college, I spent a week um, hiking in the in Colorado with some friends and for five days, we were just out uh, sleeping outside, and there was, of course, no bathing to be had for that entire week. And so when we got back, to, uh, back, back into civilization once again, it, all of us were looking forward to clearing away the days that had built up on us. Uh, baptism is something like that, um, only much more so. Baptism is something like that, except it is not just uh, clearing away the dirt that is on our bodies, but it cleanses us all the way down to our spirits. Uh, Peter, says, Peter talks about this in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, after uh, describing baptism in terms of relating it to uh, the flood of Noah and how Noah was brought um, to safety um, by those waters. He was... Uh, freed from the, the condemnation that the world was facing at the time. And Peter says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, it is not just washing things off of our bodies, uh, but it is an appeal to God for a good conscience conscience. It is God who does the washing in baptism. It is God who does the washing. Not, not the person, not me or, or whoever it is that is in the water actually physically dipping you under. Um, we're not actually doing the washing. We're uh, participating in the ceremony, but it is God who is doing the real washing. As we come into contact with the cleansing blood of Christ, and this washing takes place, it says, uh, by the, through, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this week, as our third part of this series, we are connecting baptism to the resurrection of Christ. We have looked at baptism as death, baptism as burial, and today baptism as resurrection. It is where we join in the story of Jesus. In that moment, our lives are joined to his story, to his life, to his story, to the gospel story of his death, burial, 
and resurrection. And when we are lifted up out of that water, we are raised to new life. Raised, as, as Paul says in Romans 6, 4, we've read over the last couple of weeks, raised to walk in newness of life. Um, a change has happened. We have died to our old selves. That old person has been dead and they have been buried and left behind. And now as we emerge from the water of baptism, we are born again as a new creation. And so it's a unique experience in that a death and a, and a birth happen at the same time. In the same moment the old us dies and is buried, we're having their funeral and the new us emerges as a new creation. You are a new creation in Christ. Um, those words are intentional. Uh, new creation. Back in when, when David was uh, praying in uh, Psalm 51 verse 10, after having committed uh, sin and being confronted with it, and he is repentant before God, in Psalm 51, he says to God, Create in me a clean heart. And the word that he uses to call on God to do that is the word bara. It is the word um, that is in Genesis that says that God created. And that word is never ascribed to anyone else in Scripture besides God. It is a word that is unique to God's action. And so David is calling on God to create in him, to do something that only God can do. That is what we are doing in baptism as well. We are calling on the name of the Lord. We are calling on God to do what only God can do. And as Zach read for us a moment ago, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. The new has come. We call on God to do what only God can do and he does it. We emerge from the water of baptism as a new creation. Whoever you were before that, whatever you did, that is no longer you in the eyes of God. That's someone else. That is an old person that has passed away at this point. And your past does not define you in Christ. You have been justified you have been forgiven, you have been redeemed, you have been bought with a price, you have been washed clean. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life. And we praise God for that. Jesus had a, <clears throat> a conversation with a, a Pharisee. Uh, under the cover of night in John chapter 3, a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was trying to understand who this, this rabbi was that was coming through and kind of um, confusing people and shaking things up. And he, he, he understands that something, God's doing something here. He's just not sure what exactly is going on. And part of their conversation goes like this. Jesus answered Nicodemus. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He tells Nicodemus, you want to be a part of the kingdom of God? Be born again. And those words can be translated, also could be translated as born from above. Uh, those are the two ways that those words can be translated. But essentially is communicating the same thing because we are born a second time from above. We are born of the spirit and not just born of flesh. 
This is how we enter into the kingdom of God. He says, as a result of being born of water and the Spirit, we can see what we couldn't see. We can enter what we couldn't enter, the kingdom of God. Entering into the kingdom is more than talking about going to heaven when you die. It includes that. But it is more than that. It is in that moment. It it, it is about living now and into eternity as a citizen of God's kingdom. That we enter into it, we become a part of it. We can see God's kingdom as a citizen of that kingdom. And so as we emerge from that water as a new creation, as we are born again, Christ has made us citizens of God's kingdom. Children of God's household. This is what happens to us in the water. As we emerge, we are new. We, we are now citizens of God's kingdom. We have decided to follow Jesus, to honor and to serve him as our king. To declare that he is our Lord, that he has the ultimate authority, and we acknowledge that authority over everything in our lives. He is our king, and as such, he has made us citizens of his kingdom. Um, Paul talks this way when he writes to Philippi in Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship, and he's using present terms. From it we await a Savior, and uh, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so he's pointing to something that that God is going to do in the future, but he's saying right now in the present time, we live as citizens of heaven, citizens of God's kingdom. Uh, Philippi was a Roman colony. It was an outpost of Rome. And so it was thought like the, the concept was that if you were in Philippi, that was like being in Rome. I uh, counted as being in Rome. If you, if you were there in Philippi, you were a citizen of Rome. Um, and Paul is uh, latching on to that, that understanding that they would have and trying to explain their life in Christ through that understanding. That they are here, they are, um, they are in this world, but as such they are citizens of another place. Citizens of God's kingdom. And Jesus would tell us to seek first the kingdom of God. To make that our priority. And as followers of him, we seek his kingdom. We look at life through that lens. We pursue his kingdom over anything else. Because we understand that that is home. We are sojourners here. That is home. He's a king who sees his citizens, sees his citizens differently than any other king of this world does. Because we are his children. We are citizens of his kingdom, but we are not just uh, some number on a census. Right? We are children in his household. We need to understand that that's how God sees us. We are his family. We have been spiritually born into the family of God. And so we bear his name. We are Christians. We bear his name. And because we are part of his family, we we share in a glorious inheritance. And think about how a good father sees their children. Think about the, the, the best parents that you can imagine humans being. And how they would see their children and understand that God, as a perfect parent sees his children even better than the best parent that we can think of, right? And so I think about how I see my children. Um, And being a parent has helped me understand a lot about how God sees us. And I imagine any of you who have been parents um, can agree with that. But, you know, I will find myself and my wife 
just like looking at them. They'll be doing nothing in particular of great importance, maybe playing a game, reading a book. They're maybe not aware that we're watching them, but we just kind of look at them and it just strikes us. And my wife and I will look at each other and just smile. And we realize we adore them. Like the, we, we look at them and we adore them. Understand that God adores you as his child. And children can sometimes be frustrating, right? They can be disobedient and even annoying at times. And yet, we still adore them. How much more so with our God? As parents, we are now thinking about Christmas presents with Christmas fast approaching. We want to give good gifts to our children, right? Because we adore them, right? And so we think about our Father, how he adores us. He seeks to give gifts to his children as well. That's a whole other topic we could go into. But there is a very special gift. If we're talking about baptism, there is a very special gift that is part of our new life as we emerge from those waters of baptism. To go back to Acts chapter 2. After Peter preaches that sermon at Pentecost and they heard this and they're cut to the heart, they're convicted by what Peter says. And Peter said to the Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God gives us a gift as we start our new life in Christ. He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there is so much to that gift, right? And there is a lot to unpack about the Spirit, and there's far more to unpack than we have time for for today. That's probably a whole other series in and of itself, but we'll touch on a few things today. First, let's just start off by saying, let's not forget Let's not neglect the gift that we have. Let's embrace the gift that God has given us. Let's praise him for the gift that he gives us. Let's celebrate that. Let's lean into it and rely on that. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he says, If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He says a couple of times there that the spirit dwells in you. The spirit dwells in you. And he says the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of resurrection power, dwells in you. That's a lot to try to comprehend, I think. How is that possible? It's only possible because of God's power and God's graciousness and his gift giving to you. There is this immense power of the Spirit that is in you that is often just overlooked that we don't praise God for, that we don't think about. But I hope that this reminds us, that this leads us back to leaning into our reliance on that Spirit because the Holy Spirit leads us to live a new kind of life that is holy and God-honoring. So we are a new creation. We have new birth. But then we're not just turned loose to figure it out on our own. We are given the Spirit to guide us and to shape us into the people that God is calling us to be, to live a new kind of life. When Jesus talks about the Spirit, he says in John 14 that the Spirit will teach you all things. He says in uh, John 16, he will guide you into truth. Uh, Also in Romans 8, uh, Paul talks about the Spirit praying for you. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about how the Spirit empowers you with various gifts of the Spirit as he sees fit to give you. Reliance on the Spirit in our new life that we receive in baptism is essential to living out that new life. The Spirit is essential to living out our new life. Look at how God talks about giving the Spirit through Ezekiel. A passage I come back to over and over. Ezekiel 36, 25. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you, cause you to walk in my statutes. The spirit is at work. How can we ever live a life that is pleasing to God? Well, if we try it on our own, by our own power, that fizzles out relatively quickly. We do it by the power of the Holy Spirit within us that is given to us in baptism. How do we do that? We, it's something that we, we learn to rely on the Spirit more and more as we mature in Christ. It is given to us at baptism, but we, we, have, to, we have to sort of grow into the clothes that we've been given to wear. It is something that we start to understand. We are, we are every bit as saved in the beginning as we are in the end, but we grow into, we learn what it means to walk out these things day by day, learning to rely on the Spirit. This is what it means to walk in newness of life, to be citizens of another kingdom besides this earthly one or these various earthly ones. To be children of a heavenly household and not just the ones of flesh around us. To walk by a different set of priorities, to be mo uh, motivated and moved by a different spirit within us. To live a life that is set apart from the world around us, that honors God. And even though we stumble and we trip sometimes, that's the path that we're on. And when we do stumble and we, we fall, we recognize that's just the old me. That's the dead me that I said goodbye to and we say goodbye to him again. That is the life that we're called to. We have exchanged our lives for the life of Christ. As Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's so hard to read that without saying it in the cadence of the song, right? Um, but we have, it, Paul, is, Paul is using himself as the example and saying, I, the old me, I was crucified. I died with Christ, as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. It's not me. You see somebody walking around in front of you and speaking. That's not me. That's Christ that is alive within me. And that is, again, another one of these things that can be hard to comprehend. But he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. That is not to say I simply just acknowledge that he exists. To live by faith in the Son of God is to live in reliance on him. To live in loyalty to him. For my life to be defined by faithfulness to this new way of life that he has called me to. And that I have accepted and entered into in baptism. Paul also says to the Colossians in Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ. Which is what we do when we come out of baptism. Raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Paul is often 
in these places and some others reminding Christians of who they are in Christ, of who they have become, of encouraging them to continue to let go of who they used to be, reminding them to reset their mindset on the perspective of what happened to them in baptism. The old you is gone, dead to sin. So don't be tempted to live like that again. Instead, remember that you've been raised to new life. That you are a child of God, that you've been given the gift of the Spirit to lead you in that life which carries you all the way into eternity. And so when we understand that the the thing that happens to us at baptism is a a one-time event, but it influences the rest of our lives, it is in that moment it establishes a rhythm of dying to the old self and living to the new self. A choice that we We need to be reminded of and and reinvest ourselves each and every day. And so baptism establishes in us a rhythm of new life that anticipates the resurrection to come. It establishes a rhythm in our lives of a death of the old, a resurrection to a new life. As we go through life day after day, the world around us kind of wants to resuscitate the old me. The old broken me, the world wants to resuscitate it and convince me that it wasn't that bad. But I don't need to resuscitate the old me because I've already been resurrected into the new me. That is far better, that is empowered by something far greater than anything this world offers. That the spirit is what lives within me and within you, driving us forward. We still then need to decide daily, moment by moment, that we are loyal to Christ. We are faithful to him. The old me is dead, the new me is alive by the spirit. Colossians again. Chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord. How do you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? In baptism, in the death and burial and resurrection moment. As you received him, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. Just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Um, We walk by the Spirit We walk in him again, making that choice day by day because we know that the new life is incomparably better than the old life. Don't be deceived by the world. New life in Christ is costly, but it is worth it. It is absolutely worth it. In the early church, baptism was talked about in a few ways. They had different um, terms that they used to describe it as they discussed these things. One of, the, one of the terms that they used that I really like is one, uh, is, it was illumination. They would say that somebody that was baptized had been illuminated. Uh, an example of that is here from Clement of Alexandria in the late uh, second century. He says, baptism is variously called a grace gift, illumination, perfection, washing, It is the washing through which we are cleansed of our sins, the grace gift by which the penalties of our sins are removed, the illumination through which the holy light of salvation is beheld, that is through which the divine is clearly seen. Instruction leads to faith. Faith, together with baptism, is trained by the Holy Spirit. And he has a lot to to say there. Uh, But just, I like that idea of illumination. That it is in baptism where a kind of light is turned on. Where light floods in and allows us to see God in a new way. To understand him better. And the spirit begins to light the way for us in this dark world as we are led forward by the spirit. Paul says something similar. Not to just quote Clement. But Paul says something similar uh, to the idea of illumination as well. He says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. 
with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Um, and so he goes on from there in talking about this, this light that shines in us the, to, to reveal God in a more full way, this illumination that is within us. He then goes on and says in verse 10 that we are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Our life rhythm established in baptism of death burial and resurrection is meant to continually put the gospel on display. We put the gospel on display. He says we are carrying around uh, in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested. We show Jesus to the world. To put it another way, that light that shines in us, illuminating within us, shines through us as well. Um, in John 8, Jesus said to the crowd, he said, I am the light of the world. But in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, Jesus says to the crowd, you are the light of the world. So which is it? It's both. Because Jesus is the light that shines through us. And so in being uh, the church, we are a city on a hill. We are shining the light, not of our own righteousness and goodness. We are shining the light of Jesus. The light of the world shines through us. Um, and so baptism establishes that rhythm of new life. It anticipates the resurrection that is to come. And people see that rhythm. Christ, living in us, shines through us to display the gospel to the world around us. This is part of the change. This is the big change that happens to us at baptism. New life. New birth. Out of death. Given the gift of the Spirit to continue in a rhythm of life, of setting our old selves behind and embracing the new self that we have in Christ. And all of that is not just about you getting to heaven. We praise God for that glorious result, but it's not just about you and me getting to heaven. It is about embodying the good news of Jesus for the redemption of our neighbors. And, and I'll tell you, you never know, you never know the impact that you may have on the world around you. You never know. There will be people in heaven that are there because of something that God is doing through you. It's going to happen. And you will not have known about it in this life. And I'm so excited to get to that, that point in our existence and be able to, to see all of those connections about how you... Share, you showed uh, the gospel to somebody at work, not, not even just by telling them something, but by showing them something in the way that you acted. And they, they got them thinking. They went on and they showed an example to somebody else. And there are three more people in their family that, that caught the bug as well because of what they saw in them. And all of these people show up in heaven just because you decided to be Christ-like at work. It's going to happen. And you won't even know about it until that day comes. You never know the impact that you may have as Christ's light shines through you. And it begins in baptism and continues in that rhythm that we live from that day forward. And so I'll conclude this series uh, with this passage here. Because I think this sort of sums things up. Paul says to Titus, in Titus 3.3, 3, We ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us, 
not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Are you ready to unite your life to his in baptism? Will you say goodbye to the, world, to the worldly pursuits that have guided your thoughts, that have guided your decisions? Will you instead rely on the wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit? Are you ready to walk in newness of life, allowing the light of Christ that illuminates you to illuminate the path of life for others? If you are ready to do that, then we have water just behind me. Water that is ready to immerse you into Christ. There's no better time than now And if you're ready to make that decision, then we would love for today to be the day. If you would like to do that today, or if you want to begin a conversation, or if you want some prayers, or you need to talk about anything at all, um, we're going to have some elders at the back of the room, and I would invite you to reach out to them today as you stand and sing.